There's just a ton of really great television, but they are, they are amazing, and so is the series, so let's welcome up uh, Abigail Spencer. <laughs> Aiden Young. Jay Smith Cameron. And Mark Johnson. Thanks for being here, you guys. I'm so glad to share. We haven't seen the show yet. That was the first time I'd seen episode one of season three, so we're in it. This is a little strange. So we haven't met yet, so um, <laughs> I missed the dinner last night, so because I was working, but uh, working. But uh, does everybody have a mic? Okay, great. Um, you know what? Here, let's pass this down for more. We, we have more. I want it. Uh, We'll do a duet. Jamantha. Yeah. Jamantha's here. Jamantha. <laughs> That's our secret code name when we work together. Yes, Jamantha. Jamantha was the secret code name. I, I was, the, was hoping she'd come out in the, in the thrifty town. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a little green, uh, have the green vest on. That's so lovely. So chic. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so, um, really interesting series start, that one there. And uh, uh, Mark, um, just to start with you a little bit, this series, um, season two toyed with the, with the structure a little bit as far as the first season was six episodes and it was basically six straight days. Uh, second season toyed with that a little bit, but this season kicks up right after, uh, right after Daniel, uh, like the next day. So where are we going to go in, in, in this season? I, I know that last season, I think that, so I'll, I'll try to speak for some people here, uh, uh, Abigail, your character really comes to a to a an interesting point in in her relationship with Daniel, and that she's frustrated, mm -hmm. uh, extremely frustrated, and uh, she and that, lives in frustrated. Right, and it, but this this seems like it was one of the most most uh, uh, outspoken times when she's basically wanted to say, for lack of a better word for it, okay, fuck it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean, yeah, she's yeah. there. Um, and Aiden, your character makes a decision in, in uh, most of the second season, but certainly towards the end, that uh, kind of puts the series in the spin because um, you're just, you just want out. You just want the game to end. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think what that, what that does is it left people with this sense of, I mean, and it's true to the show, and uh, I've talked to Ray about this too, um, the, the, the pacing of the show is a little, a little bit slow, and then you kind of have this kind of maddening need for conclusion, but what it's really doing is it's going against uh, type of, of a lot of dramas, we, where you want to know who the killer was, did he do it or did, did he not do it, and we want all this resolution, but the show's a much more patient that way. So uh, how, how do you think we're, where we're going to go in season three? Well, it's interesting. We started season one. Ray's conception early on is being fascinated about characters in, the, in this position. And he said, you know, you often see people who are let out of prison and, and for whatever reasons, and they're given their life back. And you'll see the first day in which they're interviewed, and they'll say they, they're going to go home and hug their mama and, and, and you know, have a nice steak, whatever. And Ray's fascination was what happens the next day? What happens the day after that? And the first season, which uh, really took, took place on, on consecutive days, I think we ended up with one, one additional day or whatever. And I think our plan here is definitely to throw everybody off. You know, there has been serious discussion about whether or not one of these, one of these seasons should actually take place outside of uh, the town of Pauly. So, um, it's, as you can tell from this, there are a number of major steps to about to be to be taken. I'm, I don't don't feel comfortable revealing them yet, but but well, it's things kind of, are in change. It's kind of like a rites of passage, you know. The first the first season was very much about you know this this boy being brought back to this world that had you know nearly shed him, and you know a family that had been completely and utterly destroyed, shattered by that night of Hannah's destruction and had rebuilt itself into this mosaic that they called themselves a family. And then Daniel, you know, Bigfoot as I call him, <laughs> he comes right back in and, you know, smashes it all over again. And, uh, and then season two was very much about that smashing, about that adolescent, that, you know, boy with no idea of consequence going out and tasting what it is to be alive. 
having survived paradoxically death row, he's he's now tasting the fruit of life, and you know, and then he's at the, uh, forced to make a decision for his freedom. He's going to give a great deal up, and he knows it will nearly destroy his family, but he wants that freedom. And we begin with season season three, which is another rite of passage. It's time to leave home, you know, and and so so who's going to survive from that? We don't know. Right, and, and Aiden, in your character, uh, you brought up adolescence, and it's it's really interesting uh, way to look at it. I know Ray has said that as well too. Um, he got put in; he was in prison uh, at a very young age, and he comes out, and he and he's wise. He's learned a lot, but he's not. But he's still kind of a he's he's like a teenager in some ways. Um, and they're erratic behavior, and obviously he he just is not thinking it through and kind of wants it to end. And then there's ramifications for everybody based on that. I think yeah, I think everybody gets. You know, a sense of, you know, how how this 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 boy was, you know, essentially captured, you know, and put in this box, and you know, didn't age. But the other part of me that was really interesting was how he aged. You know, I, I was intrigued when I got the original uh, scripts, and you know, I was intrigued by the, there was one particular scene where they bring uh, Kerwin. He arrives to the prison, and and he hears this noise, and he's Kerwin's absolutely petrified, and. You know, coming from his neighbor next door is this, um, you know, Tuvan throat singing, um, which I mastered, by the way. Um, but, but, you know, I wanted to know at that point, I wasn't so intrigued by the enlightenment of the character. I wanted to know why he wanted to be enlightened. You know, I was, I was intrigued by what were, the, what were the horrors that led him, you know, and we began to look at that. In, in season two, and with season three, we begin to, you know, we really begin to see, and Daniel begins to see that perhaps those horrors have come back to haunt him, and he's more fragile than he thought he might be. Mm -hmm. And uh, Abigail, your character, I'm just sort of circle back to that. Um, do you feel like that she got to the, that Amantha got to the point where, like, her whole life was basically revolved around helping him and saving him in some way, mm -hmm. and, and now she's come to this point where she's like, like she says, if you, if, I'm not going to help you try, you have to, tr have to try. To, and he doesn't know, he's going to try to try. So how, what state do we find her in at the end of season two and going to three? Well, I think season two was kind of uh, uh, watching someone realize that they were very codependent and then have the realization of like, oh, I don't know if I like being codependent anymore and begin to make that transition. And that's where we pick up. I mean, it's, it's just a few hours, really, after, you know, after Daniel has said this thing that he did, which is exactly, Amantha spent 20 years of her life getting Daniel free. And not just free, he want, she wanted to clear his name, like, total, total freedom. And he comes out and says, eh, no thanks. <laughs> and so it's, it's just awful. It's awful to see her have to deal with that. And Season two was, was very, it was uh, torturous to play someone in the middle of a transition. I mean, you all know it in our own lives. Like, you know when you, when you haven't made the decision yet and you're kind of in purgatory? So that was season two for me as the human and, you know, playing Amantha. And then coming back to season three, there's, um, it's, I think it's the journey of letting go and her making some decisions for herself and really growing up in the same way. It's almost, it's a totally different parallel, but the stages I think are happening for all of our characters. So there was a, definitely a, a, a more a, a lightness to co coming into season three of just like, it's, it's still the struggle why I love the show. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but just sitting watching it, I'm just like, oh my gosh. And it's it, everything that, someone says or every breath someone takes is like, what is that? What is that? You know, and it's just so amazing to me that this is living on television right now without, you know, car explosions or buildings being burnt down or, you know, gratuitous sex scenes. Like, the power of the emotional exchange between human beings is really on display in the show and it's such an honor to be a part of. So, I guess to fully answer your question, season three is, is a growing up and, um, continuing to walk that tightrope. Mm -hmm. And Jay, um, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, as Janet, or mom, or mother, as you're called on this, ver various. Mother. mother. I know, that's always a little slightly disturbing when that is, is, is you, done. You don't make fun of your children. <laughs> 
uh, she's been in a really interesting position in this, uh, watching this episode uh, last night and again today. It's just, well, there's a couple of super uncomfortable moments, but the, where she basically transposes her sons, quote unquote, uh, is, is awkward. Yes, it's awkward. Um, one of the things I think is really uh, thematic or evident in season three is that the comparing the difference of uh, truth and fact and memory. And can you ever sort that out? Can anyone ever actually determine? Because we're all going on, you know, recounted testimonies all the time, all throughout all our lives. So that's one of the themes, certainly that's an evidence in, in episode 301 for Janet and for everyone, is these sort of false memories and how over the years you've made these things that help you live with your storyline that's going on. The, yes, in that instance of the barbecue, right. Um, and also just this uh, theme or this idea of fairness, like a plea deal or a bargain you make or a, a plan you make to, to, uh, for a, an employment or how you're going to live with your um, ex-wife or your, or your estranged wife and all the things these characters go through um, as compared to what's really just. Like justice isn't always worked out through law and through deals and through what's made. And that struggle is going on not just for Daniel, but for actually every single character is struggling through that uh, moral swamp. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just really fascinating. And I wanted to, to concur with Abigail about the pace and the um, style of the show. I, I read and heard it described as slow, and it never strikes me that way when I watch it because it's so full. As you said, like. There, to me, it's crammed with dialogue. It's just unspoken. And I think that's just one of the really fascinating and, and unique things about our show. Yeah, it's, um, it was, it was been called the, um, the poster series for slow TV, but like in a good way. Like if that was yeah. a trend. There were ser shows still doing that. Not a lot of those are, are left anymore, and this is really the, the, the highlight of it. Um, but it is not, it, it's, it's slow in its pacing, but it's not slow in its, its content in it and how much is involved in it. Right. And there's just so much, there's so much meat in there. And uh, Aiden, I wanted to ask you, um, because it's, it, is a, it is a character study, this basically is. And, and Mark, you've said in uh, interviews before, it's experiential. And, and, um, and you've described uh, uh, Daniel's character as kind of like Chauncey Gardner, you know, or uh, Forrest Gump in, in some strange way. Um, you did? <laughs> he did. <laughs> he did, yeah. He went there. Yeah. Um, Intriguing. Yeah. So. Aiden, it's, it's really interesting because uh, Ray, Ray McKinnon, and everybody who's the creator and writer of the series, uh, has said that he's less interested in did he or didn't he. Um, but it's still the crux of the show in some ways, so you're, even you're, we're working around it. Um, so I wanted to ask you two things. Do you know? Has he told you? You're talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> How can I deflect this? <laughs> okay, well, you don't have, it's just, it's interesting because uh, how you would, Mission I would think accomplished. That, okay, good, yeah, right, yeah, I'll just talk over it. But if, if not knowing if it becomes whether we know or not, we do as the audience view him in different ways now, I think, right? We see him in private moments when he does stuff where you're like, oh, he, he might have done it. Uh, and the se season two ends and season three picks up basically where this, it said, I, he doesn't really know if he did it or not. And is that how you approach the character? Well, I do. I do. I mean, I, when I first met Ray, you know, uh, the first thing is you're struck by his, you know, physique. He's, he's, just, he's an odd chap, you know. And, and he came sort of marching toward me in New York. And, and so he's, he's, he's a sprite. He's come from somewhere else to visit for a while, you know. And we sat down and, you know, and... and you know, after after I'd been offered the role, and we sat down, and we began to talk about Daniel, and, and you know, we we talked at length. And just as I was leaving, I said, "Oh, are you are you going to tell me whether he's he's guilty or innocent?" And, and he said, "Do you think I should tell you?" <laughs> and so began a philosophical discussion about whether or not he was going to tell me, and and that's lasted for three years <laughs> or four years with a little hiatus in the middle, and and. You know, it intrigued me because there was, there was enough of Daniel's experience on death row to see a man who's educated per, perhaps into a darker realm uh, to survive there. And, and there's enough grief over the responsibility of the, 
the minutia of that night, you know, where, where Hannah met her, met her fate and, and that he's looked at that to scale for, for nearly 20 years every night. And he's been there and he's, he knows that if he didn't, if he'd have just, you know, stayed at home that night, if he'd have, if he'd have turned left just to, you know, but he, he remembered, he forgot his wallet and so he went back. If he hadn't forgot his wallet, they would have been maybe hit by a little car and they would have, you know, then gone home or who knows. He's been through every single second, like I said, to scale for 17 years. and. and and the responsibility of each one of those moments weighs so heavily on him that it was enough for me to say that is guilt enough if he's guilty. But it was, I had to hold on to the possible, possible injustice um, that, that, that he suffered um, and, and empathize with him at the same time. So I couldn't condemn him. I could only wonder with him that the, elast the elasticity of his neurology had perhaps clouded enough to make him either innocent or, as he knows, guilty. Did he do it? Right. I had no clue. Mm -hmm. and, and that must be interesting for you guys to play as, as actors, and uh, Aiden just talked a little bit about that, as, as um, having to have both sides of the character to, to, to pull it out, did he or didn't he? And, and um, um, for, for you two, um, how, how is that? So Amantha says, I hope he did it. You know, and, and, and it's almost like she just wants some kind of resolution. How, how do you play that now as, as going forward? Is that still a, a thing in the show that you have to grap grapple with, or are you just going to help him? Because we don't know whether you're helping him out or not. You're just blowing up the air bed at this point. <laughs> Let's go blow it up. Um, <laughs> I thought that was such a metaphor, right? Um, I believe that for Amantha, that she believes he's innocent, 100%. And I feel that that is very important. Even though she's starting to wonder, like she came to visit John at the bar hoping that he was gonna say that he was like, forget it, we're going all the way, you know? Like that's what she was hoping for. So I think to connect her to that childlike decision and also for survival. I mean, for the survival to think that she spent 20 years fighting for something that is, is true is very important to her survival. So I believe that she believes it 100%. Um, and then, you know, there's the wondering or, you know, when he says things, it's like she, she wants black and white real bad. Right, and we, we were left in season two sort of have, having her a little bit untethered in that we didn't know yeah. she was going to leave, if she was going to, you know, now she maybe makes a you know, a, a career at Thrifty Town. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was a nice look, by the way. When, <laughs> there are worse places to work. You, you get that look. You got to see where, where we shoot is like an abandoned warehouse. But what's funny is we'll be shooting at Thrifty Town, which is not a real store in Griffin, Georgia, where we shoot. Um, but people come in and try and shop. And they'll like, <laughs> they'll come into the store and we're in the middle of a take and we're like, oh, um, we're not actually a real store. And they're like, but there's all this stuff here. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, but it's, you can't buy it. <laughs> so, so it's real sad <laughs> people they come in the middle of the takes um, the thrifty town has been an incredible part of the show to kind of lean into just um, you know the working class of the world and uh, and really playing someone who is committed to without uh, judgment you know coming in and, and getting a job and moving back home and that's what she's doing so is she and i guess that's the question now is she less adrift is she do you think she's gonna now because she's we have the brief moment where right. he at the end of the episode he arrives at her house and i think she's gonna see this thing through okay. so i think uh what is the wonderful thing about rectify is you actually see choices and moments played out in, before your eyes so we're not gonna skip over any beats or any moments for any of the characters you're gonna you're gonna see this thing played through really for everyone, for all the characters, which is gonna be a really beautiful thing to witness. And, and Jay, your, your character, where it, again, you're, you're also not knowing, but believing he's innocent, but also not knowing, what, how, how is she stretched? Because now she has, you know, she, as this episode sort of indicates, she does have a replacement son in some ways, and, and, but she's torn that he's leaving, et cetera. Right, I feel like I've neglected my other sons, my stepson and my replacement son, Jared. I mean, I feel like they're totally upstaged by the return of Daniel. And I say, I say as much in that episode that I haven't been there for them, that I've been preoccupied. Um, 
And I think that they're all, all the whole family is struggling with this idea of did he or didn't he do it, except for, I mean, Amantha, as she just said, has a um, black and white view of it. And I think everyone else, well, I, I can only speak for Janet. I feel like Janet has uh, spent decades or almost, you know, a, quite a long time um, wondering if he did do it and realizing she loves him anyway. And that's that classic motherly dilemma. That would, let's say he did it, would you love him? Well, of course, because that's the one person you can count on for unconditional love. And I find that so poignant and so right at the heart of the story, you know? So I think that goes on even as he makes that deal. I think I've always felt the whole thing was uh, a corruption, but I don't know whether he did it or not, mm -hmm. you know? And, and Mark, as far as storytelling, um, obviously you worked on Breaking Bad and a ton of movies. Uh, from, your, from this perspective and, and as you deal with Ray and look at the overall, as you guys look at the series, um, where, where does it go in, in three? Because I know at the beginning, you did, you were, six was basically, or seven was going to be it and then done. And Ray didn't know if he wanted to do anymore. And here we are starting season three and last year you had ten episodes. So it's, it, it's on, but which, which, which way do you feel it's going and do you feel that that the crux of that did he or didn't he is even important anymore. You know, it's interesting. I think we probably all have our own opinions about whether or not Daniel did it. The, the beauty of it is it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter, you know? Uh, I've heard Ray say, and when pressed at one point, he had an opinion. I doubt if it's the same opinion now. Um, I think, as I'm listening to our actors talk about it, I think they have to play it with that conviction until Ray tells them otherwise. Um, and what, to just expand on what, what, what Aiden was saying, this guy has spent 17 years in prison, in real hard, hardcore prison. And he's come out damaged and he's come out guilty. I'm not exactly sure of everything that he's guilty of, but there's no way that this is an innocent man. Thanks for that. <laughs> Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> and Aiden, uh, be, just beyond the guilt or innocence, when you are, um, when you're playing this character, did, I guess where we are now, because you don't want to give spoilers away, but where we are now, um, do you feel he's aware of his decision making? Um, we're talking about the adolescence, but do you think he's aware that the decisions he's making are really messing up the lives of those around him? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> do, I have a, do I have a target on it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. And I mean, I, I, I couldn't find, as a writer myself, a better base to have a show about. You know, I think that that's such an exciting idea that here you've got a protagonist who essentially doesn't, is, is unable to see what is, a, what is happening around him because of how fractured he is by these experiences. And even if he is lost in what looks like a moment of reflection, that, that mirror is shattered, you know, because of, because of the trauma that he suffered with his own uh, guilt and responsibility and also, you know, the neighborhood of what, you know, we know in America as, as death row. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a place that you you know, you buy into, you, 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 you know, you earn your place there. And, you know, if, unfortunately for some, it's a place that, you know, they shouldn't be in. Um, I think unfortunately for all, from my perspective, but there are innocent people there, but they're few and far between because, you know, this is a world of monsters and they take them there and, and they spat one out, whether he's a monster or an innocent man, um, you know, or a guilty man, I don't know, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, it's certainly an interesting character to play when you realize that he's he's blinkered by the by the trauma he suffered. Yeah, I, I found it interesting in this uh, episode in that season two, season one was was so much wonder, right? I mean, the smart water and all coming into a modernized world after being in the hole for so long. Uh, season two still had that obviously, but less of it as it went on. 
Uh, I was struck by this first episode where he's where he tells the obviously frightened mother <laughs> that uh, he that it, it's almost too much to be reading outside under the blue, and that's that to me was almost like a callback to season one, um, and reminds you that he's still really fresh and still super innocent in some way. She she was a remarkable actor that that lady who came in. You know, every single you know actor that's come on the show has just been. You know, they brought their A game, and they're they're you know they've seen the show, or they've done their research, or you know, and they and they're just spectacular. But she was, you know, she's in a very difficult position. Here's here's a woman who's taken you know her child for a walk in a park, and along comes Daniel Holden, who wants to discuss you know Goethe or something, and 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 and, but he doesn't know how, and he's he's trying to explain that you shouldn't be afraid, and well, you you just watched it, but. You know, this this lady, uh, at the end of it, she as soon as we'd finished shooting, she, she broke down in tears because of how much we have to restrain ourselves. We've sort of grown accustomed to the trauma that we're dealing with within the subtext of the story, but I think she was slightly unaware and suddenly had a, you know, emotional inflatable bat just bang her on the back, yeah, the back of the head and go, did we just do this scene about... I, about all that without saying anything? You know? So the first season, we I mean, I remember the scene the three of us had, and um, it's where Janet and Amantha go up to Daniel's room to confront him about um, him going to the baptism. And uh, they're very concerned about him. And when we shot that scene, I mean, we were just sobbing. We were just holding each other and sobbing between takes. Because we needed to have that release to come back to the scene, because it would have been too much. But that was that was a real moment for the three of us. Uh, Tim, what you were saying about that moment on the playground, that what he says about it's almost too much. I sort of feel like, you know, there's this idea that he's like this bowling ball, and we're all the pins that get knocked over when he comes out of prison. But I think part of it and this is gonna sound a little esoteric, but I really think this, is that he's lived with the prospect of death right there. So he feels everything, he feels so alive. And it's almost threatening to us, because we're like doing the kitchen and getting buying food and going to Thrifty Town, and we're not accused of anything, we're not in danger. But we're not really living our life. And he's like experiencing this thing as if he's been on the brink of death, which he had, you know, and that that is sort of threat, it's a challenge, it's a weird threat. Does that make sense? No, it, it totally does, and um, and, I, and I think when he, well, also just the, the whole idea of, what, you know, what Aiden said about the, the actress who wasn't used to this, the, I'm sure everybody would agree, that the, the beats on this show are so different from anything else on television. There's so many added beats where, you, where we expect you to reply and you don't reply for two, three beats when it comes. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially for, for Aiden, because he's such a, it's just a slow talking character and he's very introspective and thought, uh, how much, how hard is it to maintain that emotional pullback before you do your lines? You well, I, it's really easy for me because they actually just, you know, I speak about this fast when we're shooting and they just slow it down. <laughs> you know, and so what you're reading, Well, I'm sure that's actually, uh, uh, when I said we were doing this panel, somebody said, I, I wonder if you actually really talk really fast like this in real life, because it's so <laughs> slow in the series. I met Martin Scorsese once, and I, I, I have no idea <laughs> what, he said. what he said. I mean, you know, let's not send him to meet the aliens when they come. I, exactly. You know, please. Well, I think to answer, you know, I think we have grown more accustomed to what we're exploring by season three. I think we know what we're leaning into, and yet we arrive on set and Ray pushes us that much further. And so you come in and you um, kind of, like what I was saying is that the, that is our, that's our car chase, is, is the exchange between humans, so you have to leave room for what's gonna happen next, which means that when you're in a scene, you don't know what's going to happen next. And the moment that you try and get ahead of it is the moment that luckily our you know, cohorts and collaborators and Ray comes in and brings us back. And so it's, um, it's an emotional roller coaster. You know, We used to cry between scenes in season one, now we just drink a lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, there, there was that suggestion that, that there is a local bar there that you sometimes get to. And I, one. Yeah, oh. one. <laughs> is, that, is that the place where you, where you go? Together, yeah. <laughs> there, there was some discussion about, uh, about what it's like on the set and how, and how, uh, how emotional that is. is. Is it, do you guys have to, I mean, you said you're, now you're just drinking, but are, are you, are you uh, taking moments because it's so emotional? I kid. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a. Uh, we all cling to each other. We're all, it's a very safe environment for all of us to play. I mean, it has to be safe. It has to be a safe place, and um, you have to bring all of your humanity. And I think that's maybe what that you know wonderful actress was feeling is that you're allowed to feel it all. You are allowed to be your whole human self, and 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 actually, that's what you're asked to do. You know, we actually demand that of each other. Right. So. I'll just use this. <laughs> 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 she told you we'd been drinking. <laughs> um, Ray always wants us to be completely on the brink without spilling over, except when we just really can't help it. And it's really not, we're not there yet until it's just at the, in the top drawer of our organism that we're just that upset. And it's not just Ray, it's all our directors, but that's the, the tone of the show. And Mark, let me just ask you, I, I actually don't know this answer, but is there talk about how long this wants to go? How you guys want to take this? How far? Well, Ray has trouble thinking about an additional season. It's almost like, you know, showrunners, people on television are desperate for another season. They want the show to go on. Ray's kind of hoping it ends at the end of each season, you know. So it's, it, it it's keeps both having a, me cross it, the road so I might get killed, you know. Right, right. Just go and, over there, slowly. It's, it, it's sort of like, it's a great compliment and then he immediately takes it with, oh God, do I, you know, now what happens? What do I do? And, and, and um, so I, I don't know. I, the way I see it, it's got a long life. I don't, I don't know about, about Ray. I can't say that in front of him. <laughs> yeah. How about for you guys? Oh, well, yeah. well, I heard a wonderful rumor. I don't think this has anything to do with what we're talking about, but that doesn't bother me. Um, <laughs> that the people on The Walking Dead are very, very, very nice to the producers, all the actors, because they can just get killed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they want their house, they want their Corvette or whatever they have. Whereas we, you know, we know that Ray wants to finish it, so we're foul mouthed. You know. <laughs> you know, what are you no, looking right. at me? You know, no, it's it's a uh, you know I'd love to see see the story go for for years, you know. But I, I do feel that you know you can't you can't push something too far. You 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 know it, it, it sits within its own language, you know. And that this show was ever made is somewhat of a miracle. We, we don't want to forget that because, you know, the technology came along where you could have that cinema in your room, you know, in your living room, and, and you didn't have to get the babysitter and you didn't have to, you know, get the parking and so forth. It wasn't going to be a, you know, a, a film compressed into that 90 minutes, which you had to spend $600 to go and watch, you know. Um, but it was something that you could sit down with and you could either binge it or you could watch it weekly, you know, and, and you could live with it. You could, you could allow that window to be opened to the world of Paul and to the world of these characters once a week or however you want to watch it. But I think that it came along, you know, the doors were opened by so many great shows before us, you know, and it, it hopefully will we'll maintain a place in, in, in televisions, you know, closet, yeah. so to speak, or, or mantelpiece for a while, but let's not, you know, flog a dead horse if it gets ugly. Well, it is a tantric show. I'm not sure you can binge this, this show, right? There's a pent-upness to it. You get a free therapist with every binge. <laughs> yeah, could I make a, um, a little Austin connection Absolutely. to the show, since yes. we're in Austin? Um, the theme song to the show is one of my favorites of all time, and actually... The band Balmeray that wrote it is uh, Rob Lowe, who is the one of the lead guys. He wrote the theme song of the show, and he's from Austin, an Austin artist. So they're here That's today. Great. Just wanted to tell them thank you so much. We have a, uh, just a few more minutes here. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, because this comes up anecdotally. Certainly, I hear about it when I talk about Rectify. Uh, it, it's just these these little moments on that people find you know because it's such a tense show, and then you get questions like you know. Uh, does like they'll say? Does Abigail know that her hair is messed up all the time in every scene? She messes it up. Are, 
Is that a real yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, that's a real question. I, that's, that's not from me, but that's, that's a real question. The, the target's <laughs> gone to you, sister. Um, there's an intention behind, um, you know, keeping Amantha in the fray, you know, in the in the rush of her life. So there's there was... From the beginning, as, as much as Ray, I mean, Ray is, has created all of this. We are filling Ray's vision happily and hopefully, you know. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of room for each of our characters. So, uh, you know, I don't, th you know, so all of that stuff with the details of Amantha's dress and the chip nails and the way she smokes and the hair has been uh, so much freedom as an actor to bring all of that and be very intentional and it's very supported. And she's also like the, she's the snarkiest of the bunch. She's also, right? On it, more honest, most honest. Yeah, I mean. and but, cool, very he, he quick. Said, he said snarkiest. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> yeah, I did say snarkiest. She is a little snarky. Stay with that word. Yeah. Uh, and, and Aiden, uh, it's um, your character in, in a more serious and less snarky turn. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about him, I think, and it, is that is the little, and you can talk a little bit about this, the little flashes when you see, because he's so composed and he's uh, eloquent and wise, and then he'll, he'll have a little flash in his eye or his voice changes where you think he's a menace. Well, yes, I mean, he's, he's you know, we're, as people, we, we carry this, you know, unfortunate thing around with us. All of us have it. You know, it's the monster, and it's there to protect your children. It's there to protect your loved ones. And, you know, you never, ever, ever let it out in, unless you have to. And um, unfortunately, it, it's, it's something that when you, when you go to a place, you know, when your Yale is, is George's death row, when you have that education, the monster has to come out to, so you can somehow paradoxically survive your, your death sentence. And, and you, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the monster that's there and, and whether it has already come out many years ago and was, was always wanting to come out is part of the question as well. Right, and, and on, the, on the latter side with, with, with uh, Daniel is, uh, it's almost like the question about, about her hair. Is, is your character aware of the times he's funny? And is it hard for you to not crack that smile when you say something that's either super deadpan or is actually well, I mean, for those, for those of you, for example, who hadn't seen episode one, there's this wonderful sequence where you know you mentioned it, and, and where Daniel goes into a, a convenience store and he gets a. Uh, I mean, first off, you know, here he is, 17 years back into the world, and, and you know, it's his first, second day back into the world, and and what's in front of him is a wall of refrigerators. Now, I, I remember when I was a kid, I, I, you know, my parents had a store. We had one fridge, you know, and this is, this is you know, really the time that Daniel was pretty much sent away. We, you know, we might have had one and a half, but now you... in Australia, though. The, uh, that was in Australia, mind you. you well. <laughs> Americans are they're a bit different with their shopping <laughs> habits. But anyway. Um, Consumers. So I walk into the scene, and it wasn't scripted, but I just stopped because there was this wall of... Water, you know, it, it was this. I could, I had to choose between Japanese water and F Fijian water, and New Zealand and Tibetan, and, you know. And and finally, he chooses one. He takes it to the counter and he and he looks at it and it says smart water. And he looks at the guy and says, "Does this work?" <laughs> you know. And that that's his genius. That's that's Daniel's genius in, in finding a. You know, and I love, that's why, you know, because I have to put him in the guest house every time we finish shooting. He stayed with me once when we did the first se season. He stayed, he stayed, he out did his welcome. And I, I figured the best way to get, to get him was to just put him in the guest house and I go over and visit him. You know, he comes to my door with pizza and, you know, VCRs, you know, he's like that. He's a bit old fashioned. But, you know, I, I keep him at that. I keep him at that length, and but when it gets time to crank up the engine, and I go over and I knock on his door, and there he is, sort of, you know, happy to see me. We we begin a wonderful discussion. It's great to get back into that, you know, that that wit of Daniel and that almost that perfect filter of seeing society as it is through the illusion of what we call society. We we have time for some quest, uh, a couple of questions from the crowd. So is there anybody? Is there a microphone out there that? Oh, she's waving. 
All right, there we go. Go ahead, you can just shout it out, I guess. She said the show was superb. <laughs> just to, if you didn't get that. <laughs> well, what happens is we were in our second season of Breaking Bad when I called my friend Ray McKinnon, who was in Arkansas, and he said, it's amazing you should call. I just finished a, a, a pilot script. And he sent me uh, Rectify, pretty much intact, the, the, the pilot we shot. And I immediately took it to AMC, who we were doing Breaking Bad with. Um, they loved it and said, OK, we're going to it's going to be an AMC show. As it turns out, they didn't really have room for it, and we stayed at AMC for two years. Now, the Sundance Channel is a part of AMC Networks, and I was always told that the executives there, who I uh, have great relationships and friendships with, said, be patient, we will find a place for it. And then eventually we ended up on the Sundance Channel, and we were their first original, original show. Like with Breaking Bad, both these shows, nobody quite knew what they were or what to do with them, so we were sort of given a long leash. No one knew quite how to oversee us. So by the time we, everyone knew that Rectify was special, but the, until they actually saw the first couple of episodes, they didn't real, realize how special. And, it, and it's interesting because we have uh, we have an extraordinary, extraordinary executives at, at Sundance and AMC because this is not, you know, this is obviously not a, a, a one of the, you know, the top viewed shows in the, on television today, but it has such loyal and smart and, and I think really questioning o an, an audience that everybody is just so proud that that they have it on on Sundance. I often. Um, I refer to the show almost like poetry. Poetry is not for everybody, but for those of us who like it, it just we like it in a, in a big way. And I think the key to the success of Rectify, along with our actors, is really Ray McKinnon, who conceived of it and is just a just a genius. And he is you see. Ray everywhere in in the, in an episode. You'll see him in terms of set dressing. You'll see him in a piece of wardrobe. We'll see him in a in a take of of uh, of Jay's that he likes and one that he doesn't like. And uh, it's it's great to have a, an auteur uh, who is uh, allowed to do what it is he wants to do. Well, it was also great for these people to be able to watch it and you guys to watch it on the screen here. It must be amazing to have seen it uh, in a theater. Uh, we have one time for one more question. This person's jumping out of his chair, oh, so. <laughs> this isn't a question, but um, my grandma died on Mother's Day and sort of in that emotional and empirical haze, I rewatched the Rectify pilot and sort of jamming on all of those emotions was so congruent and for that one hour, it made me like, it was kind of soothing in a way. Thank you. Thanks so much for the show, and I really appreciate it. Mr. Goodman, I read your stuff growing up in the Chronicle. Go Warriors! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, it, it was thank you. It was a uh, uh, this is great. Um, this you, this is an amazing cast. Uh, I, I worry about any actor who comes and does a cameo or uh, the little, even a small scene here because you guys really really bring it. It's a fantastic series, and I, I do hope it goes uh, on. And I, you can take as long as you want to find out whether he's innocent well, or not. Thanks to you. I mean, you know how we keep it on the air is you know people like you that have a voice and all of the critics and actually rectify won a Peabody Award, which is kind of like a. <laughs> You know, a Pulitzer to because it says that there, this matters. You know, more than more than viewership. Right? This just matters in the world. So that's pretty, you know, exciting. And, and it clearly um, impacts people. Yeah, and you can always absolutely. take it off the shelf after six seasons. We do yeah. six seasons, Aiden. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> there you have it. I mean, you know, I've got to check with Daniel. He's in the guest house. As long as you have that guest house. <laughs> Indeed. It's in his contract. Well, thanks for everybody for coming out to uh, Alamo Draft House. And thank you to the cast of uh, Rectify. <laughs>